coming up next on Eco Company. Put on your hard hat. We're headed in here where these bottles get a second life. We take those bottles, those bales, and convert them into usable product that gets resold to people that make more bottles and more PET products. It's a peek inside the place where our recycled plastic bottles end up. We'll see what it takes to make the plastic useful again. Then, taking charge. That's what this team did when he saw that change was needed. There's an energy about him and an unwillingness to say it can't be done. We catch up with the guy who single-handedly got solar panels for his school. And it's harvest day on the farm. But it's not what you might think. I've started dye farming. I realized there was a real need for color. These teens are stomping on plants used in making blue jeans. Not possible? We'll tell you how. All that and more coming up on Eco Company, starting right now. guys, thanks for tuning in to Eco Company. I'm Jelena. And I'm Josh. We all recycle our paper, our glass, and our plastic at home and at school, right? If not, we'll tell you about one teen who took the initiative to make it happen at his school. That's later in the show. But first, what happens to all of that recycled plastic? How does it actually get reused? We wanted to know, so we visited a place that takes all that plastic and turns it into something that gives it new life. They're everywhere these days. Signs telling us to recycle. But just what happens when you toss your plastic bottle into the blue bin? We're paying a visit to this recycling center to find out. It's a noisy place, but we're not complaining. This is Peninsula Plastic Recycling Center in Turlock, California. Here, workers take our tossed out plastic bottles, break them down, and turn them into something that could be reused we'll bring in about 100 million pounds of bales from the recycling stream. And then we'll convert out about 75 million of that back into the uh, uh, manufacturers that'll use PET again. Tom Sponder runs this place, and he's just the guy to answer our next question. What exactly is PET? PET is the, uh, the polymer that's most commonly used in soda bottles, water bottles, hinged trays. When you go and buy fruits and vegetables in the stores that are in hinged trays, that's PET. So most likely, it's going to be a material that's clear. The process all starts with bottles brought in from recycling centers. And then we take those bottles, those bales, and convert them into usable product that gets resold to people that make more bottles and more uh, PET products. The first step is to sort through it all, and that's no small task. What we're doing here is we're beginning to loosen up the bottles in the bales. Forklift driver will lift up that bale, drop it down, and begin the process of separation. Once sorting is done, it gets down to the nitty gritty. Those loose bottles then con uh, are conveyed up through an incline conveyor past a magnet that'll pull out as much of the ferrous metal or the magnetic metal as possible. The cans that get pulled out are sent to companies that recycle aluminum. We then run through a machine that does a pre-wash. It's important to get the plastic bottles squeaky clean. They can't have residue like dirt or sugars from juice or soda. We also heat up the bottles at that point, so the bottles start to shrink within this pre-wash system using steam, and uh, labels start to come off, and the caps start to come off. What you see behind me is a machine that takes off the labels on the bottles. At this point in our line, 99% of the labels are removed. Then the bottles are inspected by both man and machine. Workers keep a watchful eye over everything because they only want the clear stuff at the end of this line. We can sell green separately, the green being used for green soda bottles. Once it's all sorted, the bottles get ground up and sent for a final wash. Then you get these, way too many flakes to count. 
At the end of the line, all those flakes come out here and get back for the next leg of their journey to a new life. And they produce a lot of them. About 75% of what they send out to manufacturers are these bags of flakes. But there is another step. In this form, today we're running green. This flake cannot be used for direct food contact. To do that, the flakes need to go into a pelletizer, which converts the flakes into pellets. Then, the pellets go through another process. We'll run it through a machine called a solid stator and changes the molecular structure of the recycled material pellet into a form that can be used for FDA applications such as water bottles and soda bottles. These bags of plastic flakes and pellets are the building blocks for new recycled plastic products and more than just soda bottles. These days, recycled PET also goes into fibers for carpet and even clothing. This sounds great, right? There is, however, one big problem. The problem in the United States, and especially here in California, is recycling rates are so low. Uh, our issue is that we struggle getting feedstock. Um, there isn't enough of it out there. We can recycle more if we had more people recycling. Instead, a lot of our plastic waste ends up here, polluting the environment in a landfill. Or here in the ocean, where it's broken down by the sun, putting marine life at risk because creatures of the sea mistake plastic pellets for food. The solution? Simple. Recycle, recycle, recycle. <laughs> The EPA estimates it takes two-thirds less energy to manufacture products made out of recyclable plastic. Something to consider the next time you see a blue bin. So toss your plastic bottle inside, where it'll be whisked off to make something brand new. Up next, Jelena heads out to the farm. But this doesn't look like food for the table. I'm here at the Fiber Shed Farm harvesting Coreopsis, which is a natural orange dye. They're picking flowers and plants that will turn your blue jeans blue. And later, meet one impressive teen. Recycling programs, solar panels, a city environmental task force. No project is too large for this guy. More Eco Company is still ahead. Did you know that over 95% of our clothing comes from outside of the U.S.? That's a big change from 40 years ago. But Jelena found one woman who's out to change all that. We're here out at the farm, but not for what you think. We're learning about one organic way to make your blue jeans blue. Let's go check it out. It's harvest day at this Marin County farm in Northern California. But Rebecca Burgess isn't harvesting fruits and veggies on her land. It's something else entirely. And that's indigo and coreopsis. So what kind of plants are these and what are they used for? This is called Polygonum tinctorium, otherwise known as Japanese indigo. And this plant is used to make blue dye. The textile artist and environmentalist grows, harvests, and processes it on her farm. I have started dye farming. I realized there was a real need for color. That's also where these bright blossoms come into play. I'm here at Fiber Shed's farm picking Coreopsis flowers, which when added to water and set out in the sun will create a beautiful natural orange dye. Burgess's mission to create her own natural dyes is all part of a bigger picture. And that's something called a fiber shed. Fiber shed is like a watershed or a food shed. It's a geographical region you could draw on a map, literally, that outlines what parts of your landscape are required to come together to make your, your wardrobe. The idea is to wear clothing made locally, from the fabric right down to the dye. Right now, most of our garments, in fact, 99% of our garments are made uh, overseas. And Burgess isn't just talking the talk. My entire wardrobe is made up of clothing whose fibers and dye plants were all sourced within 150 miles of my front door. It sounds challenging to be sure, 
But Burgess is out to prove that it can be done. How we dye fabric. This is really an important question for all of us. Today, she's introducing a group of teens to the idea. So you are part of the first ever Grow Your Jeans project today. They'll be helping her get the indigo dried out and ready to go. We started the process of uh, stomping and sorting indigo. First, you dry the leaves out. The next step is the fun part. You separate the leaves from the stem. And they stomped it. It feels really like crunchy and dry, I don't know. It smells good too. <laughs> separated the dried leaf from the stem, and the dried leaf is what we want, that's called the blue gold, that's going to go into the dye vats when we start dyeing. The stems get composted and they go back into the soil at the end of the year. With the help of oxygen, it will turn blue, and that's how you make wow. indigo. You can get almost black from this if you dye it, if you dip it a few times, like three or four times. Yeah. Then into burlap bags it goes. Perfect, you guys got it. And does anyone have a guess on the weight on that? Okay, so that's five pairs of jeans. <laughs> and out of this project, we'll have about 400 pairs of jeans dyed. I learned that it takes a lot of effort to harvest indigo. I don't know, it's really different from just buying a pair of jeans. You don't really think about it when you go to buy a pair. Natural dyes are just one idea behind a local fiber shed. So is where you get the fibers themselves. And it goes without saying, they have to be sustainable. And that means one that doesn't use pesticides or herbicides, doesn't use genetically engineered plants, no GE cotton, no GMO cotton. And we're using water responsibly, and we are using our wool and everything in the region with ethics and care for the animals and plants. It's all part of a system designed to make you think about where your clothes come from. And that's one of the values of Fiber Shed, is to value things and to keep them in play for a long time. We want clothes that'll last a generation. There are other ways you can tread a bit lighter on the earth too when it comes to the clothes on your back. If you're one of these people who wants to dabble in Fiber Shed, the, the one way to dabble is just to start swapping clothes. It goes a long way to save energy and resources. The average American throws away 64 pounds of fabric a year. That's hundreds of acres of time and energy of growing cotton. So from growing, harvesting, and processing dye, to finding locally sourced materials, Burgess says a fiber shed is an important part of the future. If we can now inspire a new form of manufacturing, I think fiber sheds could be in every region of the country. So I welcome teens now and in the future to be a part of this movement. Thank you, everybody, and to me, I'll give you high five. <laughs> <laughs>《One student with a focus on the environment. I have to say it was fantastic to see the panels finally go up when I really didn't think it would. It was sort of a pie-in-the-sky dream. It was pretty incredible. He single-handedly got solar panels for his school, and that was anything but easy. More Eco Company is straight ahead. Now for more on Eco Company. We recently met a teen who has a wonderful credo. He says that if you think you can't have an impact on preserving the environment, then you won't. Well, he believed he could, and he did in a big way. Jordan has his story. Think you've got a busy schedule? Then you haven't met Jason Beatty. He's a student at Stanford University. But before he walked these grounds, he spent his days here at Aragon High School in Northern California, where he's left behind quite a legacy. There's an energy about him and an unwillingness to say it can't be done that is quite unique. From championing solar panels to re-energizing his school's recycling program, Beatty knew his high school should be doing more to go green, so he took action. 
If you ask my parents, they would certainly tell you that I was really gung-ho about recycling and gung-ho to the point that I was probably quite annoying. First off, he formed an environmental impact committee. It was a committee composed of parents, administrators, um, some faculty, and some students. The importance being that then I could gain an audience with the district that wouldn't just listen, that wouldn't otherwise listen to a pipsqueaky sophomore. The recycling program was sort of the first easy thing I decided I could get done, get out of the way. Jason took over the program, got it reactivated because it kind of died. He added new bins and started an awareness campaign. This trash audit helped too. Students went through the garbage, pulled out plastic bottles, and spread them out on the lawn. My brother and I went Monday morning really early, like 6.30, and we laid them all out so that when everyone got to school, there were all these, these, this trash essentially sitting in the middle of campus. It got a lot of people's attention. The goal? To get people thinking about recycling and save money too. So we calculated by the end of the first year that um, the recycling of what we were collecting uh, saved the district about $4,500. Next up, solar panels. Jason was not going to take no for an answer. Faculty advisor Doug McGlashan says earlier efforts failed because the panels cost too much. Essentially, it had been given up. And the spark that Jason brought to it was not only a determination to get it done, but every time there was a block, a barrier, a problem, Jason would think it through. I spent a good deal of time researching to try to figure out, okay, um, how, can, how can the district raise this money in an efficient way that is going to be positive gain over time. Beatty finally convinced the school board the energy savings would be worth it. The process took three years. I have to say it was fantastic to see the panels finally go up when I really didn't think it would. It was sort of a pie in the sky dream. It was pretty incredible. Even more incredible, they'll save the district about a million bucks a year. If that wasn't enough, Beatty also served on his city's Environmental Sustainability Task Force. Its sole goal, its sole mission was to create a sustainability report, a report of recommendations for the city to implement to make itself more environmentally friendly. He became the committee's vice chair and headed the Solid Waste Subcommittee. I was working with a group of adults who were really passionate and knowledgeable in different domains. Sally Liu served alongside him. We as the committee were very excited to have a high school student who was so interested in environmental sustainability and he just proved to be such a powerhouse. I think it's, it's crucial that we start making these uh, decisions uh, soon rather than later. On their recommendation list, ways to save energy and water, plus ways to reduce trash like banning styrofoam. Just this year we have passed an ordinance banning um, the use of styrofoam and that was another big interest of Jason's and the committee's. Styrofoam particularly is not easily recyclable. We're littering our streets and getting out to the bay. On a roll on his turf, Beatty joined the nonprofit Green Youth Alliance and soon became co-director. Green Youth Alliance is a group of high school students um, from different high schools that are connected by their interest in environmental sustainability. Members focus on energy, food, and water, and do things like creek cleanups. We're coming here and trying to restore some of the natural ecosystems um, by getting rid of these invasive ivy. Gladwin D'Souza serves on the board with Beatty. Jason's a real doer, and uh, that really what uh, was inspirational to the other students was seeing him working on the solar project with the San Mateo School District and uh, actually seeing results. It's now a project for the Green Youth Alliance to follow up on because it's a model that we can copy. So from helping green up his city to inspiring other students and championing the power of the sun, Jason Beatty is proof of the power of one. His perseverance was what uh, really got surprised him. Our committee was so wowed by him. He showed such um, decisiveness in his actions and such strength of character. I, I really think that a lot of Jason's success has simply been that he doesn't quit. Jason Beatty, eco-warrior for the planet. And we can't wait to see what he does next. Um, don't 
underestimate your own abilities to, to make a difference. You could be a part of Eco Company too. Create your own video. Shoot a story about being green. Or somebody doing something unique to help save the planet. Maybe your school is doing something to reduce its carbon footprint. Or shoot a video tip showing something all teens can do to help preserve our resources. Add some music and have some fun. Then upload your video at eco-company.tv. Your video could be selected to be on the show. And you'll get an Eco Company wristband to show that you're committed to helping save the planet. So join the company, Eco Company, and be a part of the solution. That wraps up another episode of Eco Company. Thanks for tuning in. For more information on the stories in the show, or to give us your feedback, head to our website at eco-company.tv. And check us out on Facebook. We'll see you back here next time. On Eco Company. Eco Company.